This is video three in a series of four videos where I talk about how I made this piece here. In video three, I went over sculpting the antlers uh, and sculpting the face. This was with a two-part epoxy resin called Magic Sculpt. Uh, in this video, I'm really just going to go over how I painted it. And it's really just a variety of uh, washes and dry brushing. So the plans for the antlers were to mimic this paint combination on the small piece here. On this piece I used a Payne's Gray wash for the base layer and then on top of that uh, I dry brushed a silver gouache. So for the wash I am just using these throwaway chip brushes, uh, a little bit of paint, a lot of water so the application is very wet so I can blot it with a rag. Uh, this is the uh, paint I'm using. It's a Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray is a black with just a hint of blue. Um, somewhere on this YouTube channel I did a whole video that talks about washes and why I prefer the uh, Payne's Gray over the blacks. So I put a nice amount of paint on the palette paper and start adding water. I try to work fast here because I really want to keep all of the paint wet. And the amount of water that you add is really going to determine uh, how light or how dark the wash is. Then I drape a piece of cloth over the paint and lightly pat it to remove some of the paint. Then I spend a little time uh, with the rag patting around kind of dictating where uh, I want the texture to be and how defined I want it to be. You can use different types of fabrics to pick up different types of texture, uh, burlap, leather, terry cloth towels. You can also bunch up a cloth and dab it uh, to get a really nice marbled effect. I've even seen people use saran wrap to get a really nice marbling look. I just want it to be a little blotchy so it looks like a tarnished metal. So here's the first wash layer, it's almost dry. Um, you can see that it really creates this nice texture. Uh, it also kind of emphasizes the shadows because where uh, the rag didn't blot it, uh, you get these dark areas in the recessed areas like in the crux of the thumb and the pointer finger. Also uh, in the shadows in between the fingers. And that's kind of the main reason I do this base layer. Um, I'm going to dry brush a uh, silver gouache on top of it so this really just kind of provides a layer underneath that gives it a little bit of texture, highlights the shadows, um, so ideally the piece when it's finished looks a little bit more realistic. I'm using a traditional gouache for this. A gouache is basically an opaque watercolor. They generally have more pigment, so you can get these super saturated and vibrant colors. For my washes, I like to use these big flat filbert brushes. Filberts have these nice round edges as opposed to the uh, sharp square brushes. I feel like it's easier to blend everything in with the round edged brushes. So the idea behind dry brushing is that you don't use any water and you just have a little bit of paint on your brush and you're really just kind of lightly dusting the whole piece. I'll even wipe the brush on the back of my glove or sometimes on a piece of newspaper a bit just to really make sure that the amount of paint uh, on the brush is very light. This is a size 10 brush that I'm using right here but you'll see that later I switch to a size 50 just to make things go a little bit faster. So again I'm just lightly skimming across the top of the surface with the brush here. This way if you have any recessed areas or texture, the brush is really just uh, skimming across the top of it and really just highlighting the top. So all the recessed areas will retain whatever base color or texture you have put underneath. I try to make sure I'm always brushing in different directions and different angles. I think this is a really good way to just blend in all of the brush marks. I'm also constantly switching out brushes when I do this. Without any water, the paint tends to dry on the brush a lot faster, and it also seems to clump up a lot faster, especially with the gouache because it's a thicker paint. 
when that happens the texture is not as soft and uniform and you get a lot of uh, kind of brush streaks so I always have a lot of extra brushes on side that I could keep cycling through for me it seems like there's a good five minute window before I have to switch the brush out so one of the nice things about dry brushing is you could just keep dry brushing uh, more layers on top of different colors so mixed with the uh, base layers and the washes it's a really great way to build up textures and colors for the face I do the same thing with the first wash Paints gray with a little bit of water and then I pat it with a rag I'm not really concerned about leaving a texture here with this wash as there is a texture in the clay that I'll really be emphasizing with a lot of dry brushing what I do want to highlight with this wash is the eyes the nose the mouth and the uh, ring around the entire face so then I get into the dry brushing again with the flat wide brush and this first layer is with a pale pink usually when I'm painting faces I use some combination of these four colors pale pink titanium white apricot and yellow ochre by blending these colors on top of each other with uh, washes and dry brushing, I usually end up with something that I like. And there really is a lot of variety in how I use them. Uh, sometimes I'm very methodical and layer them one by one on top of each other. Other times I'll have all of them out on the palette uh, and just start sampling from one another. So sometimes it's planned, sometimes it's totally random. And for the second layer, I'm going to dry brush a white on top of that. These two washes of pink and then white will just add a little bit of color variation underneath the next layers. So for the third layer, I have a pink and white and a yellow ochre on the paint palette. And I'm mixing a little bit of water and randomly blending all those colors into kind of a wash. But I'm not going to blot this layer off, I'm just going to let it sit and what it really does is it ends up becoming a transparent layer uh, that picks up all the color variations from the previous layers. This is a layer that you really have to be careful with. Uh, because the brush is so wet, uh, sometimes the pressure of that brush can kind of pull off some of the previous layers. So I just kind of do this very carefully and I try to do it fast. So here you can see the finished look of these three layers. The color shift is very subtle. You can see it go from pink to white with a little bit of yellow here and there, which for me is just enough to really pick up the texture of the piece and kind of keep it away from that uh, flat, opaque look. And then here I'm just doing one final uh, light dry brush with white. The piece was just a little dark for me, so this is just like one final highlight. And then at the very end, I'm using this Interference Gold. Uh, it's from Golden. It's a fluid acrylic. And I'm using this big, soft watercolor wash brush. This brush is perfect for dusting on a super light layer. The Interference colors are a series they have where the paint interacts with the light at a certain angle. I use their Interference and Iridescent paints uh, all the time. Um, the iridescent kind of give a more uniform shimmer uh, where the interference is a little bit more subtle. A lot of the interference colors will also do a color shift so it'll be one color uh, when it catches the light at one angle and then another color at a different angle. So the next video will be the final video in this series and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how I did the felting of this piece. Um, this is roving wool and the process is basically stabbing it over and over with a needle until it kind of compacts in on itself um, and creates this nice felt texture. So stay 